Welcome to section 15.7. All right, gentle people, last we talked, we were proposing mechanisms for our overall reaction. Now, when we did this, we proposed these elementary steps, and it turned out that in these uh, series of steps, one of the steps was the slow step or the rate determining step. And based on the slow step, we were able to write the rate law. So here's a question. What would happen if both of these elementary steps or all of your elementary steps are about the same rate? Well, then what you can kind of say or what can happen is that there is going to be more than one rate determining step. And the question is, how do we go ahead and propose mechanisms for this? And how do we write rate laws based on this idea that multiple steps are a slow step or there is no one rate determining step? So what we're going to invoke is called the steady state approximation. So let's go ahead and take a look at this equation right here. So what I'm saying is that my overall reaction is A going to B. Now I'm going to say that this is going to happen in two steps. A is going to make this intermediate I, and then I is going to go ahead and turn into B my products. Now what the steady state approximation says that the intermediate, the concentration of that intermediate is going to be steady. Or in other words, what I can say, the change in concentration of my intermediate over time is zero or doesn't change. And so we can take a look at this graph. And so you guys have seen this before. A, my reactants goes ahead and decreases. Uh, B, my products increase over time. And then after uh, on a little bit of an induction period, what I'm saying with the steady state approximation is here is my intermediates. Once I generate just a little bit of it, my intermediates, they do not change concentration. Note, it's not zero concentration. It's just that they are not changing concentration, meaning the rate of my production of my intermediate is going to equal the rate of my consumption. And if I subtract these two, I will go ahead and get zero. Okay, so your book gives you a rather complicated example uh, for steady state approximation. So I'm just gonna keep it with that simple reaction of A going to I, I going to B, I is my intermediate. And again, I is under steady state, meaning its concentration isn't changing uh, during the course of the reaction. Or another way to say it is let's look at its rate of production and its rate of consumption. So if I want to go ahead and say what is the rate of production of I, my intermediate, so how do I make I? Well, I make I from my A. So in other words, the total rate of production for I is going to equal K1 times the concentration of A. Now again, I'm going to say that this is going to be an elementary step so I can follow molecularity uh, up uh, on the reaction up on top. So now that I got my rate of production, let's look at my rate of consumption. So how does I go away? Well, I goes away by reacting away and becoming a B. So in other words, what I can say is the rate of consumption of I is going to be based on the concentration of I times K2. Again, following, following molecularity. So remember that the rate of production minus the rate of consumption, that has to equal zero. That is the steady state approximation. So if that's the case, I can get two kind of equivalencies out of that. So if I re rearrange that equation, what I can do is I can express the concentration of I, and that's simply going to be K1 over K2 times the concentration of A. Or another thing I can say is that K1A equals K2I. So let's go ahead and see what we can do with this. Let's go ahead and get a rate. So if I want to say what is the rate of this overall reaction, well, I can look at B. And what I can say is the rate of this reaction is going to be dB dt. Well, what's making B? Well, B, the, the production of B, is going to be K2 times I. But again, I don't want to use this as the rate law. 
because it has an intermediate. But I know that K2 times I, well, that equals K1 times A. So I can make that substitution. And so for this proposed mechanism, the overall rate is going to be K1 times A. So let's go ahead and look at your book's example, which was much more complicated. So gentle people, this is going to be kind of a long derivation, so it's a good idea to grab those slides and make sure you have access to them because I'm going to be flipping uh, through a couple of slides so that you guys can follow me. Like I said, the book gives you this really complicated uh, kind of steady state problem, but it is great to look at. So here's what we have. Here's our reaction that we are going to try to evaluate. So here's my overall reaction. 2NO plus H2 gets me N2O plus H2O. So the mechanism that the book is proposing is this two-step mechanism. I've got an equilibrium. 2NO goes to N2O2. Note that this is not a fast equilibrium. I'm not telling you that one of these is slow and one of these are fast. So if I don't specify which reaction is slow or which one's fast, you can assume that they are going at the same rate. And so there is no rate determining step or both of them are the rate determining step. And that's why we have to invoke the steady state approximation. So again, the steady state approximation says we have to look at our intermediate and our intermediate is not going to change concentration over time. So in this case, we can see that N2O2 is our intermediate, it is first produced, and then it is consumed during the course of the reaction, which means that N2O2, the change in concentration over time, is zero. Or another way that I can say it is that the rate of production equals the rate of consumption for N2O2. So let's go ahead and look at the rate of production for N2O2, where I look at this reaction that the only place that I can see N2O2 being made is in that first reaction. And in that first reaction, if I combine two NOs, I make N2O2. So in red right here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the rate of production K1 NO squared. Now I want to go ahead and look at the rate of consumption. So I want to see every place that N2O2 gets eaten away or consumed. So one place it gets consumed is if I run that first reaction backwards. And so this is the products becoming reactants because it's an equilibrium. And to do that, I get K to the negative 1, N2O2. Now, there's another place that N2O2 is being consumed, and that's in the second reaction right here. In the second reaction, it just moves forward. N2O2 combines with hydrogen, and that goes ahead and chews up my N2O2. So I can write that consumption rate as K2 N2O2 times H2, both of those to the first uh, power. So now I've got my steady state approximation right here. What I can go ahead and do is I can go ahead and rearrange this. And what I want to do is I want to go ahead and have N2O2, the concentration of that, on one side. And so I end up rearranging that equation to this one below right here. All right, so let's go ahead and remember what's going on. I found an expression on the last slide for N2O2 using the steady state approximation. Here's my overall reaction. And so what I want to do now is I want to go ahead and write the rate of my reaction. Now, what I can do is I can say this in terms of my reactant, and I can look at the disappearance of H2 versus time. Now, I chose this one, or I think your book chose this one, because you can see that H2 is only in one of the equations right here. And so if I wanted to go ahead and write the rate law based off of this equation, or the destruction of H2, what I can write is that the rate 
equals minus dH2 over dT. And we can see in our proposed mechanism that the consumption right here of H, uh, H2 is going to be K2N2O2 times H2. Now, again, this leads us to a problem. This right here is an intermediate. You guys don't see it in the overall reaction, and I can't have an intermediate inside of my rate law. So what the steady state approximation does is it says, okay, we've expressed our intermediate concentration in terms of everything else, so I'm gonna make my substitution. So if I make my substitution, here is what my rate law uh, appears as, and you can see now I'm kind of happy. I've got hydrogen, NO, uh, and H2, so all reactants uh, in this particular case. I have no intermediates. And so what I can do is do a little bit of a rearrangement of this. And so I'm just trying to put all my Ks together and all my reactants together. And so this ugly beast of an equation, this is my new rate law. Now this looks pretty daunting. We've got Ks all over the place. We've got concentrations all over the place. And we have one even uh, to the second order uh, in, this, uh, re uh, in this rate law. So what does this tell us and how can this be useful? So again, here's that beast of an equation. Here's that beast of a rate law. What can I do with this? So what I can do is I can go into lab and judiciously pick how I run this experiment. So the one thing that I can do is I can try to simplify this and see if I can get some rate constants pulled out. One thing I can do is I can make my experiment such that K2 times H2 is gonna be much, 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 much bigger than K to the negative one. And the way that I do this is if I go ahead and have a juggernaut of a concentration, a really huge concentration of H2, well, this term becomes so huge that my K minus one becomes insignificant. So this is just like your ice tables where you're adding something together and the thing that you're adding doesn't matter. And if it doesn't matter, well, then I can say that this kind of simplifies to this expression right here and you guys can see uh, this is the consequence. Now, once I do this, I can do a little bit more cancellations. My K2s cancel out, my H2s cancel out, and I simplify my equation to this. And so now what we can do is we can run our experiment, and if we do it such that I have a huge amount of H2, I can pull out a K1, and I can also verify that it's second order and NO. And so if that's the case, great, I can try to verify this mechanism. So the second time I do this concentration, instead of making H2 really big, I'm gonna make H2 really small. Now, if I make H2 really small, well, K2 times H2 is gonna be really small, and my hope is it's gonna be much, much, much smaller than K to the negative one. Now, if that's the case, we can look at this top reaction right here again. And so this time around, K to the minus one is gonna be really big. And this K2 times H2 is insignificant. So I can go ahead and take that away. And then my reaction goes ahead and simplifies to this. Now what you guys will see, a whole bunch of constants, a constant times a constant divided by a constant, well, that can just be one constant. And now what we get is a new rate law under these new set of conditions, and I can test that out experimentally. I can get this experimental K. I can use it to help me find what K2 is. And now I know I can verify this mechanism because under these conditions, it'll be first order in H2. All right, let's go ahead and practice using the steady state approximation. So I'm giving you an overall reaction right here, and I want you guys to follow this mechanism, and I want you to tell me what the rate law is going to be. Uh, you can express rate in terms of products, and so I'm gonna throw up this quiz, and what I want you guys to do is just work this out 
and just hit the right one. But I want you to really try this one out. All right, gentle people, let's go ahead and tackle this one out. So I asked you guys to express the rate in terms of products. So I'm gonna write D products or the change in concentration of products over time. And that is going to have to equal some rate. So if I look at my two steps or my two elementary steps, I can see products is made in the second step only. And that is going to be K2, the second, uh, the second rate constant times A times M. And what we should note here is M is an intermediate. So I do not want to have this intermediate inside of my rate law. So I'm going to use the steady state approximation. And what the steady state approximation says is the rate of production of M equals the rate of consumption of M. So that means production equals uh, consumption. So let's go ahead and write those two things uh, for M. So if I look at my reaction, where I am producing M, well, that's gonna be my first reaction, so K1, and I have A coming together with B. And that's the only place I make M. So let's look at the places where I consume M. Well, that first elementary step, what I can say is if I run that reaction backwards, so K to the minus one times the concentration of M, that goes ahead and chews up my M. I also consume M in the second and elementary step. That's gonna be K2, and that's gonna be A times uh, M. And go ahead and uh, try to get an expression where I just have M. So I'm just gonna pull out an M from here, and this is going to be K to the minus one plus K2 times A. And that's in parentheses. And on the same other side, I still have uh, the same things present, A times B. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and isolate our M. So let's divide our reactions K to the one times A times B. And then I'm gonna go ahead and divide this by K to the negative one plus K two A and now the concentration of it. And so now what I can do is I can do a substitution so that I can get rid of M in my rate law right here. So I'm gonna go ahead dp dt so remember that this is rate and so this equals k2 a and this becomes time so instead of that m i'm gonna write k1 a b over k to the minus one plus k2 a and so i'm just going to go ahead and combine some terms together i've got k2 and then I've got my K1, I've got A times A, so that's gonna be A squared. I'm gonna have a B up on top, and then on the bottom, K to the minus one, K2 all over A. And so this right here should be the rate law that you get for this reaction. I hope that made sense to you guys, and again, stay safe.